Thank you. It is awesome to be here. Love USU. I applied to both USU and BYU. BYU rejected me, and I am so thankful. None of that would have happened. So go Aggies. So we get to tell the story today. So we are up in Petersboro, the hamlet of Petersboro, and uh, we have a bunch of test tracks. Uh, we have another building here now, and we've got a bunch of engineers and then business support around those engineers to make autonomous vehicles. That's the command center you see in the top right where all of that magic happens. That's where they watch all of the vehicles and do the testing and make sure that the, the systems are testing the right capabilities and that they're performing before we go and put that software onto 400 ton vehicles that can run over your house. And so we're making, we have the world's largest robot, uh, mining trucks running down in uh, Elko, Nevada, where they, we're gonna have to shut the mine down because no one wants to live in Elko, Nevada, apparently. And so they run out of drivers every year. And so they've told the drivers that we need to train you on how to run the software. We're not laying anyone off, but we've gotta have automation to help. Another place where there's a challenge is in California. Uh, we talked to the world's largest strawberry growers and they said that 30, 60 out of the 200 strawberry growers went out of business last year because they can't get labor out of Mexico. And so with the minimum wage hikes from the Democrats and the border block from the Republicans, it's a win-win. So <clears throat> I'm agnostic, uh, it's <laughs> both good. So they are banging on our doors for solutions because they're going out of business, they can't get the labor to staff their farms. So, I'll tell a little about the story. I was born in Grassy Lake, Alberta, Canada, 122 people. It is called a hamlet. And there was a Tory in every grade in my senior year uh, with my cousins. So I could high five all of them from kindergarten to 12 in the hallway, 11 in my graduating class and 11 in my family. And the motivational for autonomy, if you're driving in a circle 16 hours a day all summer, and I missed 66, year, 66 days my senior year doing farm work, and so you really want to automate that after a couple of summers. So we say that's really the genesis of what we've done here. But it really started in my undergrad program with Jan Soike in the physics department. And he gave me the opportunity to work on space shuttle programs. And we were able to put two projects up on the space shuttle, flying different experiments in the payload bay. An incredible opportunity. Uh, he started to help me with some grocery money after the first year of volunteering. And it gave me some incredible skills, and it was a lot of that volunteer time that helped develop the ability to, to do some pretty crazy things. We were making circuit boards in uh, dark rooms and being able to get those to run on a, a shuttle that has 10 Gs accelerations and vibrations like crazy. And so that really formed the skill set that I needed for the next phase of my life, which was I wanted to be a speaker designer for Bose and then design my own speaker systems. And one day I saw this wheelchair driving down the hallway in the engineering building and it's using ultrasonic. So it's using sound mounted on the fronts of this vehicle, front of this vehicle to navigate safely down a hallway and avoid obstacles and keep it in the center so someone with low skill uh, with uh, their arms can still navigate independently. So I chased down the the student who was driving it from a computer, found out who his professor was, and started to bug him. And eventually, this is him, he's Dr. Robert Gunnerson. We got stuck in an elevator in the Sear building, and I had been bugging him for three months. And obviously, he'd seen my GPA, and so he wasn't gonna give me a job. And, <clears throat> okay, I milked a lot of cows, and not to have that being waken up by my, woken up by my mother every morning, I didn't go to class very much. So <clears throat> had only about a 3.0, and so he finally exasperatingly said, fine, can you solder? And I said, I'm a darn good solder. I put stuff on the space shuttle. I'm your man. And so he hired me, and we were able to build that robot, and we soldered it together. And uh, Dr. Don Cripps, who now is a professor in the electrical engineering department, Brought me under his wing. I started out as a bolt sorter, and he helped me get opportunities, not get depressed that I was just sorting bolts the first couple of months. 
and eventually got to that place where I was building cool things and eventually wrote a paper that John Deere saw. And John Deere came to me after I wrote the paper and said, hey, we want to make an autonomous vehicle that doesn't kill people. Can you prove that a three-year-old playing chicken with you, we have the technology to stop that tractor from killing the three-year-old? And so we got a little remote control car and we put a little three-year-old mannequin on it and we ran it uh, in front of this largest uh, 9,000 series John Deere tractor as fast as we could and we would play chicken with it and no cars were killed, no three-year-old mannequins were killed in the testing and we were able to validate that it was safe and then that launched into a product program and so they said that they wanted to partner with us. The other problem that was happening at the same time was in Afghanistan and people were getting killed as they were going into caves to try to get the bad guys out, try to get the ammunition and the bomb parts that they were hiding in those caves. And I thought there should be a better way where we wouldn't hurt people. So I took apart three of my kids' remote control toys and I fashioned some tracks that could climb. And you saw the video of the ultimate product climbing. So I then stole their Legos and I built a functional model of what I thought would have the capabilities of climbing over those rocks in those caves. And then I built a styrofoam model, and then I painted it green. <laughs> and <clears throat> I still can't believe today, but my brother was willing to come with me, and we went to the SWAT team in Logan, and we said, we need $50,000 and we'll give you a bomb robot. That didn't go well. <laughs> so they did not give me $50,000 for this brilliance. And <clears throat> I was able to convince a professor to give me $5,000 in venture capital. And so with that, we were able to buy some parts. We uh, partnered with a farmer who could weld aluminum named James Godfrey. And we used some tracks from the cheese factory, fashioned some of our own gears, the little rubber, rubber parts there from a wheel well, window well, and remote control from an airplane. And we went to an FBI show, this was in the hotel, and we worked three nights in a row and had four hours of sleep over those three nights total. And we were afraid the FBI were going to tra come into our room and shoot us because we were making so much noise at night trying to get the thing built in time. But anyway, we were able to pull it off and we got a million dollars at that show to build the real thing. You can see they backed up too much and rammed it through a wall, but that's the... <clears throat> That's what we were able to build going from the stolen toys to the million dollar pitch to the FBI and the government labs that were willing to fund us. And so that was our founding in 2000 with a product target with John Deere of doing an orchard tractor and this is what ultimately was built and then a parallel project with the government. And what was interesting is we had our first near death experience as a company with this robot because the liability attorneys were very concerned that farmers already disable systems every year, safety systems, and hurt themselves. And they will settle out of court to keep it from getting in the paper because they take off a safety shield like a PTO shaft and wrap themselves around it and then settle with the widow. And that could happen fairly easy with a tractor. How do you avoid with a robotic tractor that they just take that laser that's looking for obstacles and just point it into the sky? Uh, because uh, too many sagebrush or tumbleweeds are triggering its safety system, so we need to disable it. And so they felt like there was no way to make these safe. They didn't feel like there was enough sales, and so they stopped that. Luckily, we had volunteered to do a golf course mower for free. And in our spare time on the weekends, we automated a golf course mower, and then we got a million-dollar contract for that. And we're able to then keep the company alive and keep the business members out of their mother-in-law's basement. So <laughs> these are the founders and some of the original team. So we brought two professors out and one, two, three, four, five students. And that was our founding team. And then my wife joined as well and she took over all of the finances, administration, HR, that side of it. I was still programming. Uh, you can see me down here programming the tractor. And so I was doing the programming of the tractor and business development. I was terrible. 
And so luckily we got enough money to hire some real programmers and I transitioned into more of the sales business development role. Uh, lots of team building, that's my wife and I soldering up a robot. <clears throat> that's us putting the cement floor into this garage. It's a fairly big garage, but that's the kind of team building we did. Uh, and then the, some of the initial projects with that million dollar grant to get those vehicles going were really how we got the, vehicle, the company off the ground. This is what the robot ultimately looked like. There were different variants. This was like an insect that the body would pivot in the middle and so it would twist and turn and adapt to the, the ground. This was in marine exercises uh, where they were in Indonesia and they were doing rescue operations where they would rescue people who were shot. And this was right after they had bought all the robots for Iraq and we've, we missed that and so we're praying for another war and we haven't gotten it yet, but I'm kidding, we wouldn't do that. So it really hasn't gotten, we've sold some for underground mining, some of those rough terrain. It's probably our most requested robot, but it's very random in the applications and so we really haven't ramped up to sell it because we don't have that killer application. So, I want to talk about some of the principles that we learned and applied. One of them is having a vision, and Covey talked about a vision, and so I wrote one down. It wasn't until I went to a really cool conference a couple of years ago where I understood the power of having a good vision for your business. And they brought in some experts from Stanford, and they talked about this research that they did, and they partnered with a bank, and they put your face on the savings page of your bank account and they would age your face. And so if this is you today, they would take your face and age it to 65. And then depending on how much you save that month, you would either frown, mediocre, and then up to giddy smile if you got up into that 20 or 30% savings. And that really intrigued me. How much more would people save with that? That was the test. And they tried it with different people's faces. It didn't work, it had to be your own face. They tried it without smiling and you weren't as motivated, you weren't as happy. And that future state and imagining your future state changed the savings from an average of 41% increase and up to 200%. And so that just slammed me. Holy cow, if I can visualize a future, I'm gonna change my behavior today. And if I could get all of my team in that same mindset where I am showing where we're going to be and what it's gonna feel like and how happy and giddy you're going to be that we made it, then we'll make the sacrifices today to change that behavior. And so it went from a thing I put on a slide for my staff once a year to I've gotta get this internalized, I've got to get this clarity to where we're going so that everyone feels it and changes their behavior every day because of it. <clears throat> so Merrill Lynch actually implemented it and it is now a product. So if you're a Merrill Lynch member, you can go in, you can be a part of this, what do they call it? The about you face, face retirement. Product called face retirement. And so it ages you up. You can see what the price of milk is at your target retirements and it changes behavior and they make a lot more money because they provide a vision for you of your future the realities of where you're going to be at that future state. Smiling, frowning, the cost of living, all of those kinds of things. Incredibly powerful. Now I've got to get that into my business. So, give you a fun example. <clears throat> a year and a half ago, I showed my team of rockers where I wanted to go with a school of rock and jazz and a jazz venue for the valley. And so I showed them all this picture. I said, this is what we need to get to. And a year and a half later, we opened about four weeks ago. So it's not quite identical. We still haven't gotten the round tables in. We ran out of money. But <clears throat> the school is up and operating. We've got how many kids? 35? Almost 40 kids in the classes now after a couple of weeks. And at the end of this quarter, you can all come down for a jazz venue Friday nights and listen to my son drumming and some other bands from Salt Lake. So it really happened. And it is really close to the original, and I kept putting that in front of the team. This is what we're going for. This is what we're going to make a reality in the valley. And so it was kind of fun. And 
At the same time, I went and paid Design West to do up a vision of where we want ASI to be and what that looks like. And so that they can get excited about that and real and imagine what it's going to be like to go to this kind of a place with free f breakfast, free lunch. Have you approved that yet? Darn it. <clears throat> In theory, we will have bananas at the entrance for lunch. <laughs> so <clears throat> that, that reality now is changing behavior. They're thinking bigger. They're not thinking we're going to be in a barn the rest of our careers, but this is going to be an international corporation, and they start thinking differently. You think differently if you're designing something for a single farmer versus thousands. You're thinking differently when you're making financial decisions about positioning yourself for world domination versus just keeping food on the table. And so where did we get on the vision of the organization? And this gets me excited. Financial independence for all the owners and a company where you'll want to work even when you don't have to, meaning it actually worked. We got to you to financial independence and it is so awesome to work at ASI, you will still shuffle in at 75 and 80 because of how amazing the culture is, how it feels to win, how it feels to be around great people and a good culture. And we made everybody owners. And so now we have an ESOP for all of our people, so they're all owners, so the goal is everybody gets financial independence. That drives very different behavior than a nine to five job. And that's the kind of behavior I wanted. And I wanted driven by their motivation to get there versus me pounding the podium and you must perform so I could get my second Ferrari. I don't have the first one, but <laughs> that general idea that you're just gonna make the shareholders rich. You're just gonna make the, the leadership team elect with their shares that you don't have access to, that kind of a thing. So, so that's the vision of what we're trying to build. That is hard to get that combination. A place you would go to even if you don't have to financially go. That utopian of I want to be there even though I could be anywhere else on this planet. And how do you do that? I read Steve Jobs' biography and I got incredibly depressed. <clears throat> Because he did what I needed to do, simplify something extremely complex. You've got a robot system with lots of computers, lots of vehicles, these video game interfaces around the planet where you can tap into the system and see it get dated, up-to-date analysis of how, lo how are the mining trucks doing or the farm tractors, that kind of thing. You've got GPS, you've got communication systems, and you've got obstacle detection lasers and radars. How do we make it simple? And... I realized that I could not do it. I could not be like him. He was a jerk. Uh, he got nicer near the end. But if you read that book, you will get a feeling of the kinds of things he did to get it done. The mouse, it wasn't smooth enough. You stupid idiot, if you don't get this smooth, you're out of here. He's fired, another guy's fired, another guy's fired. Don't come back unless this works, you stupid idiot and I'm not using the bad words that he used. And I'm like, I can't do that. I cannot get to where I need to go. And that was incredibly depressing. And I literally prayed to be a jerk, not in those exact words, but to be able to go to an engineer and say, you're offering, your baby is ugly, and you better go back and work on that baby because it is not fast enough, it's not simple enough, it's not whatever. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I am not good at that. And I literally tried to figure out and harden myself to care about their feelings because I had to push them to do things that they don't think is possible. That's what Steve Jobs did. You cannot get that radio signal into an aluminum shell on that phone. He pushed them to do the things that they didn't think was possible until they were able to do it. I can't get there. And so that was so depressing. And as I struggled with that, I came across this quote that I had memorized years before and it triggered that, wait a minute, if you'd win a man to your cause and that's what I have, I have a cause if I can be a friend and I can do that. I can do that. I can be a friend. I can help those engineers if I give us a common goal, financial independence. I want to help you as a friend get there too. We've got to get this to simple. 
we've got to get this faster or better or whatever it is. And that was so exciting, and I realized I'm going to get biblical here. David and Goliath, I realized I was trying to put on the sword of Steve Jobs and the shield of Steve Jobs, and it wouldn't fit. I could not function that way. I could not have a company where I was around people who were yelling and screaming at each other. That is not a place I would want to go the next day if I didn't have to. And, and so what is my slingshot? That, that quest became a passion. And I realized that it's a humble culture because if I have a culture where people are humble with each other, there's no such thing as confrontation with a humble person. You go to them and they say, hey, how can I do better? Oh, well, here's some things. That mouse is not smooth enough. That whatever, it is awesome. Uh, if you have someone who's defensive and not humble, or if you have someone who's coming to them who isn't humble and saying, you stupid idiot, it doesn't work. You have to have humble on both sides. And I realized that would be the most effective company possible because you would get the most out of every team member in that room. You'd have a humble leader who's listening to all of those people. You'd have people submitting ideas in a humble way that would be easily agreed to. And I thought that should beat these other cultures. And so I got pretty excited about it. And we'd initially tried to start a consensus culture. I wanted everybody to be happy. And so we have to have everybody agree. And that is the slowest model of innovation because to get agreement from everybody, you will never get there, or you will eject the wrong people in the room that disagree with you so that you can make a decision. So you won't invite that safety guy when you're trying to get approval for a 400-ton mining truck that can crush your house, right? They will never agree to that, so you will never sell one, and you have to have him in the room. So you can't have consensus culture. You have to have a decision maker. So you've got to have the diversity before a decision. You've got to have the ideas of everybody in the room, and you have to have the humility so that everyone will voice their opinion even if it wasn't chosen last time, and that is hard. When I made a decision to hire someone that was not the recommended choice by one of my executives, he was furious because I didn't listen to him, and why do I even voice my opinion if he's not going to choose my chosen candidate? You have to have humble. But if you have humble, then you can have the diversity before and then after the decision you have consensus. You get on that same page. And that is so hard. That humility to get on board with the second best idea like it was your own. It's always the second best idea, right? It wasn't yours, <clears throat> which was the first best idea. Can you get on board? Can you get everybody? Can you have a culture where everyone gets on board with the decision Whoever the decision maker is, and if he's humble, that's vital because he's listened to everybody. You've felt listened to over the history of the relationship. Can you get on board with an idea like it was your own? And then the second one, and this is even harder for our humble litmus test, can you address a perceived shortfall in a fellow owner in a way that they would still want to come to work tomorrow even if they didn't have to because they're financially independent? Does that make sense? So you've got a problem with somebody. Uh, purchasing didn't get me the part in time, or this department didn't do what they said they would do, can I interact with them talking about that gap in a way that they'd still come to work tomorrow even if they were millionaires and could go anywhere else and do anything else? That is a skill, and that takes humility that is hard to find. And so that's the quest. I know that's my slingshot culture. That is how we can be the world's leaders if I can get a culture like that, because we will get the best ideas in every room and we will rule. So we set up a system. We now have, every quarter, we have survey questions on everybody. So the managers are all surveyed. I know if there's a humble problem in my culture. I know the ranking of humble on every one of my managers. And so we have the, all of our values, and we have questions for each of the values. And those values changed when I realized what my slingshot was. And then I put a system around, how am I going to get to that culture as fast as possible and make sure that we find out where the problems are, that we push the people out who aren't humble because it's just not a place that they want to be. And that takes effort to get that into your DNA. 
but then you get that automatic ejection. And our humble scores have gone up over and over and over. And now that's one of our highest scores. I believe it is our highest score. Our team is incredible at humble. Now we're working on the how do you get to world domination in execution? Get, I'm a really nice guy. How do I go to him and confront a lack of performance in a way that he still wants to come back and high five me tomorrow? That's hard. So we're working on that part. So we have surveys. We know exactly where we are every quarter. Uh, I have a humble survey that people do on me and my leadership team, and so we know how we're doing. And I love that. And so I can go in with all of my managers. My performance, what do they call this? Performance interviews? Well, interview. Our performance interviews are awesome because it's irrelevant what I think. We look at the data. And they are surveyed by their people and their customers, and we just sit on the same side of the table and look at the results. And what can we do? So in general, we have guidance coming in that leadership team makes decisions, engineering does the, the execution, and then they have a product. So we bring surveys back from engineering, we bring surveys back from the customer. They then reflect, here's what I've heard, and then here are the three things I'm going to do to improve my leadership to my team members, and here's what I'm gonna to do to my customer to improve our partnership, our relationship, our product. And then they also have a third one, which is their leadership plan, and so it's a three by three, ultimately. So that's a big part of the culture and getting to that utopia and getting that DNA into the DNA, your values is just so vital. And then once you do that, then delegation and scaling is easy because everyone understands the framework for decisions. They understand the kinds of decisions we want them to make. Do we care about profitability or the people? It's the people. And so you can scale because people understand the right kinds of decisions to be making versus you having to be there and micromanaging and limiting the growth. Now, how do you fund this? How do you get to world domination? How do you get to this utopian of funding everyone's financial independence? Because that, that's a lot of money. How do we get to them where they don't have to work the rest of their lives? How do you do that? So what color of money is that? it would seem silly to want to exit playing with robots. And if you truly love what you do, then having an exit strategy doesn't seem to make sense. But most of the money out there is based on an exit strategy. And so my 20 year quest has been, how can I find the right money for world domination that doesn't compromise the culture, that doesn't turn my people over to another business that has a different culture that won't be a place that they want to work tomorrow. That is hard and it is rare. And most of the money that is celebrated out there, the deals that are celebrated, the companies that are uh, promoted in the press are those who've taken that three to five, se three to five, three to seven year exit kind of money. And that doesn't meet my goals. And so how do we get there? Is it going public? I was asked to go speak at iRobot and I talked to their staff and had a great presentation, I thought. And I went and talked to the CTO and they were laying off 50 people that week and they had 100 million in the bank. And I said to him, what are you doing? I don't get why you're putting these people on the street when you've got all that cash. I've got 50 bucks. <laughs> 47. And <laughs> the, the answer was, well, we can't get our ratio inverted so that the stock price drops Boeing will buy us and move us to Georgia. That was his answer. 50 people who put their heart and soul into growing that business and they were put on the street because of a stock price. I'm like, okay, that's, that's definitely not my answer. And <clears throat> when I was working with John Deere, they had this book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And so over a napkin at a restaurant after a demo, they drew out these plots that Clayton Christensen had shown how innovation will overtake these large companies that aren't innovating. And, and so they shared their concerns being the mammoth in the industry that they're going to get disrupted. And that was my niche. I can do that for big companies. I can be their innovator 
their lab that will go out there and create new technologies while they're working on the maintenance of the products that are existing and the incremental improvements to those products. And so that was my sales pitch. And so I took that to all these other companies. And I think we've raved, raised 160, 170 million through this model of going to businesses and saying, we can help you innovate. We can be your innovator solution. And that is a way that I didn't have to compromise our culture. I didn't have to turn my people over to someone else after three to five, seven years, go play on the beach and turn them over to some other organization that would not care about them as much as I do. So we created kind of a platform business where we had different market applications. You saw some of the video. And created these separately so that we wouldn't have that liability concern where customers suing a John Deere wouldn't compromise the mining business and the people that were putting money into that and the relationships that we had there. And the other is so that I could raise a minority investment in these separate entities. And so we were able to do that last year and we sold 34% of mining to one of the world leading mining companies that has a distribution uh, and service and support around the world. And we haven't lost control of the company. We now have the channel that we need for world domination in mining and we have the capital to refine the products. And so we're getting incredible, exciting traction and there's been announcements and uh, some bigger ones are coming in the next couple of weeks. So it's working and now we can replicate that model as we try to figure out how to get that world domination channel in each of these markets. So I want to talk a little bit about the journey. I got pretty frustrated because I'd read all the recipe books that are out there on how to build a great company. And it was pretty clear steps. You do these seven steps and you get an incredible company. We, and I realized that this joke stopped being funny when I started to recognize some of these turns in the road because there are so many surprises that hit you. And I really found that the, the entrepreneurs, um, like Mike went out and interviewed all these entrepreneurs and found out what the reality is. And he went out and did it himself. And my eureka moment was when I read the Richard Branson biography because he really talked about the challenges that <clears throat> happen that are surprises, that have nothing to do with you making a mistake. It just is hard. And I wanted to tell you a couple of those for us. We were doing amazing until 2007. At the end of 2008, the recession hit and things piled hard. We lost significant market and we had to lay off a bunch of people, multiple rounds of layoffs. And my CFO said, it's not looking good, I'm out. And so as he was packing up his bags, and saying goodbye, he passed my son on his way to his death. And my son has suffered his whole life from depression and had a lot of self-harm and things like that going on in his life. And that day happened to be a rough day where the kids decided that he was bisexual and started to bully him about that. And he came home just distraught. And I had gone off to Toronto through Denver to go and try to sell some bulldozers to keep the company in business. And my son took the car, came home very frustrated and sad, talked to my wife, talked him through it. We thought he was doing pretty good. Uh, he, he decided he needed to get away. So he took the vehicle. Uh, the police turned on their lights and started to chase him. And then he died in a rollover. But he was brain dead. And they weren't sure how it was going to go and I was in the Denver airport and so I got a call and they said, you need to come home, we're not, it doesn't seem serious, but we need you to get back here as soon as possible. And so I ran, got a rental car and started to drive because the airport got shut down from a snowstorm and there were no flights out. So I started to drive and then they gave me news, actually he's brain dead, but if you want to say goodbye, you need to hurry. And so. Drove as fast as I could, uh, but the snowstorm shut down the highway, and so I had to stay over that evening in a hotel and waited, waited. At 5 o'clock, they let us out, and so we got back on the road. A couple of hours down the road, there was a car accident. Someone died, and they shut down the road again. And so sitting in a snowstorm on the side of the road, they said, 
we need to turn off his life support system so that he can give his organs that he was hoping to donate. Do you want to listen on the cell phone? And so I got to hear those final beeps saying goodbye to my son. And incredibly blessed with healing after that, but that burning why, why, why just tortured me. And this is him and such a special kid. He was so kind and that is one of the things about people who suffer from depression is they're sensitive of other people and their feelings. And I could not figure out why he would be taken. And I've always liked this quote from Covey, which said, until a person could say deeply and honestly, I am what I am today because of my choices yesterday, that person cannot say I choose otherwise. And that's about empowerment, that until you can take responsibility for what's happened to you and take credit and responsibility for those choices, you cannot choose a different future. And that's interesting. And, and then I read this story. And it was about a guy named Don Wood. And he, he had a dream after he was going into a nasty surgery. And he dreamed that he was in a life before this life. And they were teaching about what you needed to learn in this life. And he wrote, the teacher wrote the word cystic fibrosis on the whiteboard. And that's what he was suffering from. And he saw himself raise his hand and volunteer to take that challenge. And he said, no longer did I consider myself a victim after I woke up, that I chose that. And so no longer is it God did something to me. No longer is it the consequences of the universe, whatever, that I, that was my choice and changed his attitude, changed his response to everything that was going on. And that just blew my mind. Like, wow, what if I, it doesn't matter if it's real or not. I'm going to try this mindset on, and it is incredible. And now when you read this, until a person can deeply and honestly say, I am what I am today because of my choices, that means anything that happens to you. And that is powerful. I call it the absolute, my, absolute ownership. You own whatever happens to you. And it's a mindset flip. My daughter uh, that we're adopting right here named Olivia, she was born to a lady living on the street. And she can grow up with that feeling of I'm unwanted, I am garbage, or I'm one of the valiant and brave who volunteered so a paraplegic could have a child because she was adopted by my sister-in-law before she died after seven years and we were able to adopt her. How does she see herself? Uh, my wife was sexually abused by her dad. Does she see herself as a worthless object or does she see herself as one of the strong ones who was willing to go and stop that cycle and to stand up and stop the abuse from happening. And so what I'm talking about is what is the best, healthiest, most empowering response you can have to anything that happens in your life? My son suffered from depression. I'm worthless. There is no hope. Or I was one of the brave ones willing to take a rough journey to help others. After my son died, nine girls came up to us and said that they were his girlfriend, that he didn't want us to know, but that he was someone that made them feel special, that built them up. Like it says on the tombstone, you were, quotes here from friends, you were nice enough to come up and be my friend when I had none at all. Another person said, you just love me for me. He was so kind to other people, and that comes with that depression. You're so much more sensitive to others. If I see that as that willingness to take the hard road, then I act differently both if I have that and towards those who do. So that shout for joy quest, we call it. There's a scripture in the Bible that talks about life before and that all the sons shouted for joy. So that's what we use at work and ask that question. Why did I volunteer and shout for joy for this challenge? And we even used it last this week with something that was hitting us. Like, why the heck did I shout for joy for this? Because it is killing me. And you're looking for the brilliance, the upside, the positive from it. And another way to ask that same question is, how can I respond to this so that I will look back and shout for joy that it happened? What can I do to add to this side so that the suffering we had for losing our son outweighs and gets me to that point where I can shout for joy that I lost my son and put him in the ground? And so I do things like this PowerPoint. I look at the things that I have learned that has made me better. Last year, I was looking in the mirror, and I didn't like what I saw. My hair was not where I wanted it to be. <laughs> and then the thought came to my mind, well, you shouted for joy for this. You volunteered for it, you idiot. 
Uh, well, why would I do that? <clears throat> well, maybe I'm someone who chose a harder path. I chose that I wanted someone who would marry me for my insides. If I was good looking, I may have got a superficial woman, but I got an amazing woman who liked what was inside. So then when I look at myself in the mirror or other people who are ugly, the more ugly they are, the braver they are, the more powerful they are, the more I admire them. Complete mindset flip, right? <clears throat> the same with LGBT. Those are people who are oppressed that I have in the past looked at negatively as someone I don't understand and that's pretty weird. If I look at them in, and these are actual quotes from my friends who are LGBT, who I love, and change that to the brave ones who volunteered for that so that I could learn how to unconditionally love someone who's different than me. Wow, now I look at them differently. So, do we look at our suffering as punishment, or do we look at it as muscle building that gives us strength for the future challenges and the future wins that we're aching for? I loved the airball game with Kobe Bryant. He was a rookie, they were playing the jazz, he shot three airballs, lost the game for them, and he went home, went to his high school, shot all that night, and committed to shoot every morning to lift weights and to work his tail off to never have that happen again. And that pain that he went through, he looked back and he said it was misery. But I look at it with fond memories now because of where it got me. And so as we are going through rough experiences, do we look at that as the key for my future trophies? Or do we look at that as why is this happening to me? It's not fair. This sucks. Very different perspective and you get far better results. So 2018, I got a chance to practice this. We had no idea how we were going to spend all the money that we were going to get in 2018. We had incredible uh, product orders, projects lined up, millions and millions of dollars. And then one by one, within a couple of weeks, there was a reorg organization and a major mining company lost a $5 million sale. The most powerful man in automotive whose purchasing department had just sent me an email saying we want a $4 million contract, died of a shoulder surgery, and the contract disappeared. A couple of weeks later, a tornado went through our partner's facility that we were about to kick off automating one of the largest, I think it was the largest solar farm creation project, and destroyed their factory, shut down the project, and we were supposed to have a kickoff meeting two days before, after this tornado, and poof, that was gone. And so we lost about $17 million in a matter of a month. That feeds a lot of people. And we went from we can't spend it to we are in deep trouble. And I was asked to go speak for Silicon Slopes. And I thought it was funny how they put in the advertisement, four incredible entrepreneurs shared their insights and they were getting the crowd excited to see these brilliant entrepreneurs. And as I was driving to give this presentation and scan my credit card, I realized that we had no money left. We had maxed out all of our lines of credit. The bank had given us all the money they could and now my credit cards were all maxed. And ironically, as I was 300, no, yeah, 400 yards from giving this brilliant speech about how to be successful and I couldn't pay for my own gas. So that was a rough day. And <clears throat> someone took advantage of me and took $15 million uh, out of our company and because they could, because we were desperate. And I was so mad. And I was trying to figure out the words to put to my frustration that someone I had trusted took advantage of us in this moment and took that $15 million and why did I shout for joy for this? Why did I volunteer for this? And I kept telling myself, I volunteer for this, shout it for joy, go team, what is it? And that changed the experience because it was a quest to find those nuggets. What am I supposed to learn from this? What muscle ripping growth am I to get here so that I can get that bigger trophy later? And when I tried to think of the word, despitefully used came to mind, and I was like, no, because that mean I needed to love him. What was that scripture? Love him and pray for him. And I'm like, 
that is not what I wanted to do. And as we were meeting as a management team, one of our executives said in exasperation, we are headed for a brick wall at 60 miles an hour. We've got to lay off our people. And Devin, one of our executives, had given me this quote a couple of months before, and he said that great leaders would never put the people before profit and that you keep the people. And so we decided as a team we were not going to lay off the 70 people that would allow us to make payroll in four weeks and that we would ride it out and that we would land our projects. And we were able to do it. And we were able to pull it off. It took a miracle. Cash Valley Bank was incredible in extending us the credit to make it. We were 24 hours from losing everything. And why, why, why? Why did I shout for joy for this? Well, one executive's kids, the one who said that why we are heading for a wall at 60 miles an hour, his kids went home after that. He went home after that meeting, told his kids. His kids went to school and told the other employees' kids. And those kids knew that we cared about them. They knew that even if my house was up on the block, which it was, of losing everything, I put them first. And that is a reason to shout for joy, that our, that our employees know that they mean the world to us. So what is your compelling why? You've got to find that. I found mine when I was over in Africa working with an orphanage. And this little kid was weeping in the corner because he didn't get to play with a phone. And I realized that he would never have a father to hug him and tuck him in at night. And for the 15-hour flight back home, I was tormented because I knew that I was too soft to lay anyone off. And I had someone who was leading one of our business organizations who was destroying us. Four of our main partners said, I will not go to another meeting that he is in. His employees saw him programming one of his personal games that he was selling on the app store. And it was killing the company, and I couldn't confront him and get him out of the business. But after 15 hours of anguish because I couldn't help this kid, because I couldn't go and confront him, pushed me to the limit, and I took him in, and if there's a viral video about how not to lay off a guy, I am in it. It was <laughs> terrible. But I got through it. And I figured out where my fuel was. And so we created a foundation in my son's name. And every year we take employees down. I think we had uh, 33 one year, 17 this last year, where we helped kids in Guatemala uh, with uh, different things like nutrition and education and empowerment and entrepreneurship. So to end, I love what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. One of the illusions of life is that the present hour is not the critical decisive hour. And as we talk about how to respond to things, that absolute ownership mindset of whatever's happening in your life, that if you turn that to the positive, if you think about it as a muscle ripping muscle building experience, whatever that is. And I don't care if it's just who you're sitting next to today. If you thought that I shouted for joy to sit next to this guy and I volunteered for it, that changes your world. Because when you're sitting next to a guy on an airplane and you think, oh, I wonder why I shouted for joy to sit next to this person, you start to talk to them. And you have incredible experiences from the mundane all the way up to the tragedies in your life. If you look at them with that mindset flip of, I chose this, I own this, you will get the muscle building experiences that will pave the way for incredible success. So discover your why, create the how, and then ex exercise that absolute ownership today. Love to help you with any questions you have. Right now, you can see and have links to the rest of those things that I've talked about as far as the businesses I'm involved in on mailtory.com and would love to answer any questions you have now. Okay, who wants to have our first question? Well, one thing I didn't mention, and I can't give all the details, but that $15 million and passing that test of loving that guy saved the business. And it was hard, but it built a muscle in me of forgiveness 
and the willingness to let whatever happened happen, it paved the way for an incredible thing about two months later. And can't share all the details, but it was amazing how that turned to be the next trophy that I needed because I passed that test and was kind to that guy and treated him like a friend. Yeah. So, I'm trying to think how to best word this. This, your presentation was really different than what, was, what I was expecting, partly because you own this automation and robotics company and you've spoken very little about robotics. Um, and it seems like you care way more about people than you do robotics, period. And, and you've kind of talked about how you got to that point, but I guess my question is how, how did you get to the point where you care more about the people than the thing that initially got you into what you're doing? Mm. Good question. What's your major? Holy cow. Psychology. <laughs> is it? Oh, man. Goodness. We're going to have to take this offline. I, that's a great question. I think I can be pragmatic about it, is that if you take care of your people, then you're going to be the world leader because they will be there because they love to be there. They will give 100% of everything they have. You think about those, those parents who heard that I was willing to risk everything for their jobs, how much are they gonna give at work tomorrow? How much effort and creativity and devotion and loyalty versus taking 10% raise somewhere else? They know I'm gonna take care of them. They know my goal is financial independence for them and it's not more money for me. That gets me the best robots. So that's the pragmatic, that's not the the warm, mushy answer. I went into the Congo and I meditated and I was transformed. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, logically, it's the right answer. But I wouldn't say many people believe that. And that's, that's the quest I'm trying to prove because when I showed that vision to my engineers, they're like, whoa, I don't get the connection. How does making this a place that we love to work and will come tomorrow, even if we don't have to financially, get us to that place where we are the world leader in robotics. Well, you want to be at a place where you are winning, where you're around incredible people who are humble, who are willing to give their ideas in a way that are humble, that accept yours and value your input. That should get you to financial independence, better than the yelling and the screaming, and you better help me get my goals so I can make the shareholders happy. Great question. Bueller. Um, uh, when you said that you made all your employees owners, did you just give them equity in, uh, in stocks or shares or, or what? Great and question. How did, you, how did that work? So. That has also been a dilemma over the years because we're not going public, we're not selling the company so that they will cash in on an exit. And we came to the model that the government put in place and it's called an ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Plan. And so that's a trust where every year we give them free shares like a 401k and then as they retire, then they cash out and every year there's an independent party that comes in and audits the organization and gives it a value based on best practices for valuation. And so every year they're given an allotment and the value of the company grows and then their value grows. Great question. Yes. Uh, as a friend and a, a big fan of yours, I'm thinking about how we met. You're my only groupie, and but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, we met at um, Home Depot. We were looking for just the right size washer and stuff, and I was building something. And anyway, um, I learned from you, you told me your story then, and I learned from you a uh, really important thing that helped me through a really difficult ordeal that I just went through. Um, I'm wondering in your own experience how often what could be easily called Yeah. Just the right person at the right time, as things to be there, and, and what, yeah. do you, what do you make of that? 
I'm writing a book. I, because it doesn't matter. Like, I act as if everything happened for a reason that I shot it for joy and volunteered for it because it's so awesome. And my response to sitting next to someone on a plane, it doesn't matter if that was coincidence. I get the most possible good out of that interaction that could happen. Everything bad that happens to me, I am looking for the nugget of why the heck would I have volunteered and shouted for joy for that happening. I find those nuggets. I make those nuggets. And so it is irrelevant whether it really happened or not that I believe any of that. But that quest and believe that it's actually there, that there is a reason for shouting for joy for whatever this is, and good enough that I would have volunteered for it, transforms every response in an incredible way. And so I tried that mindset on after reading about that guy's dream, and it was like standing in front of the mirror and going, hair loss sucks, to, oh, well, I'm one of the brave ones who was willing. <laughs> Whoa, you kick! wow, you're a Marine. So it transformed me from a sad feeling to, oh, well, there's a positive there, and I transformed it. And so it is so powerful that I have to get a book. So it, you really need to try it on, because every interaction, even I'm stuck in traffic. Why did I shout for joy for this? Or maybe there was an accident up there, time for an audio book. There must be a nugget I'm going to get to listen to today that I really needed. But you're seeking in every interaction, in every response, this is muscle ripping. This is what I need for that future thing. And so you make the most of every possible thing that happens. Yeah. I just want to thank you for like, teaching me that several years ago. You know, You've had a rough journey, falling off a ladder and breaking your neck and being in the hospital for yeah. weeks and months. Yeah, actually, it's a blessing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I'm thankful. Yeah. And that, that quest for... Why would I shout for joy for this? I'm trying to figure that out and asking that question, but believing there's answers and then making those. Like losing my son, I am on a quest to get as much on that side of the scale as I can get. And so that I can get there and when I see him again one day, we can shout for joy that it happened. But if I don't and I'm like, this is happening to me, this is bad, uh, those kids were gonna go beat up those kids that bullied my son that gets nothing shout for joy. Yeah, question. Uh, since we're on the subject of books, sort of, um, I'm a book reader, and I know that you mentioned the book, uh, Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah. Are there any other books that you suggest individuals should read throughout the year that maybe would help us to, I guess, get more motivated in our endeavors? More motivated in your endeavors. <clears throat> or I guess how to handle them better? Yeah, that's a great question. I've got a list, and if you email me, uh, I think, yeah, mel at asirobots.com, I can get you the list. I'm too nervous in front of all these intimidating, brilliant kids to rattle the list off, but there's some great ones out there. Effective Executive by Peter Drucker, How to Win Friends and Influence People is something you should read every year. There are uh, the What's the, the scaling one? Scaling up. Scaling up is a great one with very practical tools and templates that helps. Scale is a book uh, that's great. There's lots, there's lots, but I can share you a list if you email me that are kind of the ones that were relevant to my journey that made the most uh, impact on our journey. Great question. This will be the last question, by the way. Yeah, in the back. Just on your microphone. How Perfect. do you um, balance it with family Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a witness here, so it's very hard to tell you a brilliant story that's not true. <laughs> so, I think one of the big ones is getting your mission, vision, values right so that you can delegate. And so this year, I have been able to turn over a large part of the company so that I do have more time. And once you get that in place, those values, like if I have my engineering teams 
rating their manager and I have the customers rating my manager, then I don't have to be there. It's a self-controlling perpetual engine that goes, if there's an exception, I can see that. I'm talking to him every quarter as I read all of the comments from his people, from his customers, then he can go and he knows the kind of decisions, the priorities in those decisions. People over profitability, he knows that. He doesn't have to come and ask me, I don't have to be there making sure that he's making the right decisions. And so you have to identify the values and the principles and once you've done that and get that into the DNA and everyone understands them, you don't have to be in the day-to-day -day operations. And so I've been able to pull out of that largely. I've been able to, to turn over day-to-day -day operations and just work on those world domination funding projects and really working on the DNA. So how do I get our story as far as the values better articulated? How do I get it more into the DNA? So we're writing an ASI way book right now that they can all have at their desk. And our partner who bought the 34%, that's one of the great things we learned from them was the value of a book like that that explains who we are, what's important to us, what is our strategy, how do we feel about people, and so I'm working on that book right now. So that helps take the pressure off if you truly get that ingrained in the DNA. Also, when I do travel, taking my kids with me, and so I've been able to take uh, kids on trips and get that bonding time with them, and that's helped Reagan. Have I lied yet, and are there any better answers that I haven't? Score on one to 10, how am I doing? She doesn't want to lie. She's going to go with awesome. All right. Thanks so much, guys.